Welcome to the EAI seminars on Zoom. Uh, my name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asian Institute, and I'm delighted to have you all in the room for a, a very interesting talk by Professor Frank Pieke. Um, the Chinese Communist Party has, um, or China has, of course, been extending its influence around the world in economic matters, in security matters, in diplomatic matters. Uh, and and uh, China has also gotten a little bit of a reputation in, in, in influencing politics, influencing opinions around the world. <clears throat> That's one thing that the Communist Party does uh, internationally, but they're also doing something else. And, and that is, if you want, party building internationally. That's the focus of today's uh, talk, building the party abroad, <clears throat> the Chinese <clears throat> Communist Party's overseas organizing power. And we're delighted to have Frank Pieke, Uh, professor Frank Pieke is uh, the Professor of Modern China Studies at Leiden Asia Center, but he's also a, a visiting research professor at the East Asian Institute, virtually for now, but who knows, he will actually show up in Singapore at some point in, mm. in the future. Uh, Frank has a very extensive <coughs> uh, CV that you can read online, but I would like to highlight that he set up the Oxford Center, uh, uh, the Oxford China Center. He also was a co-founder and executive director of the Leiden Asia Center. And he was the director of the MacArthur Institute of China Studies in Berlin. And as I said, he's also a professor in uh, China Studies in Leiden. So without further ado, Frank, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Bert. Um, And thanks for the opportunity to present this uh, article um, or paper, which I've submitted to um, the journal called uh, Perspective Chinoise, or translated brilliantly into English as Chinese Perspectives. Um, and it's currently under review. Uh, it was also written for a conference uh, last month on the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party um, held virtually in in Paris. Um, the reason that I work um, or in this article on uh, the issue of uh, party building uh, abroad um, has to do with the fact that I actually stumbled into this topic when I was doing a project for the Dutch government earlier this year on um, influencing uh, of the Chinese Communist Party's united front uh, amongst the Dutch Chinese communities. Um, and one of the things I ran into then, uh, as an aside really, was that the party sometimes does indeed do party building abroad. And then I started digging into this topic a little bit more, um, looking at Chinese publications, academic publications, non-academic publications. And to my surprise, actually, I found that this is a very rich field, not only work, but also a very rich field of publication. So there's lots of stuff there. Um, To, to read and to uh, get to, to, to grips with. Um, so that was actually quite fun. And I decided that um, I could work on this more and focus on a, a full paper for this uh, and not just treat it as one of the little bits to the, uh, for that project on the Dutch, Chinese and Chinese Communist parties uh, influencing uh, in the Netherlands. So there we are. Um, I very much see this article also as part of my larger uh, research agenda, um, which um, I summarize with the word superpower. Um, and then superpower not as something that projects its influence abroad so much, but rather superpower as something you develop as a country. And in our case, also the party, the Communist Party, uh, a quality that you gradually Uh, a mass build up as your influence abroad grows, but a quality that then also has an impact on you yourself. So superpower is also something that changes China from within, as it were, and it's not just something that we outside of China experience. Um, and I think card or par party building is a is a very nice uh, one of the of the very nice angles to do uh, that because the way that the party builds its organization abroad is of course informed by the way that the party does that domestically, but the constraints abroad are very different and that has then implications, increasing implications also for 
how the party views itself, how the party organizes and disciplines um, itself also in China. Uh, other aspects of this large project, which ultimately is supposed to be a book that I'll be working on, hopefully before I um, uh, can no longer work. Um, uh, aspects, for instance, are the issue of comprehensive national security as something that has an increasing impact uh, on China. Um, but I also would like to look at a little bit later is the impact of the Belt and Road on uh, the way that companies big companies, particularly in China, and local governments in China operate. And lastly, something that I have worked already on quite extensively uh, is the issue of immigration. So how foreign immigrants uh, change the, the ethnic and also to some extent the cultural landscape of China and how the state and society deal with that. Um, so um, it's not a standalone paper. It's a paper that is lar part of a developing larger agenda. Um, what um, I've done for this paper is I have what I haven't done is do interviews with people. Uh, I've only done some interviews with uh, Ch overseas Chinese in the Netherlands for that earlier project in which I also broached the subject of party membership and party activities uh, that didn't yield very much, surprisingly. <laughs> um, so I decided that for this project actually it wouldn't make too much sense really to uh, try to do a lot of interviews, although I'll give it another stab uh, later on this year as part of another project that I'll be doing for the Dutch government again on uh, the influence of the Chinese Communist Party uh, in, among its businesses uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but I'm, I'm not expecting too much come, to come out of these interviews. So for this paper, I've relied exclusively, you can say, apart from a few things in coming out of these interviews that I uh, already did, rely on Chinese publications, uh, Chinese academic publications, or what passes for academic publications sometimes. But also, of course, things uh, that more generally are available on the internet, um, media, uh, of course, production, uh, and also um, party documents uh, and regulations. Um, and for the latter, we have relied very heavily on a WeChat official accounts. Um, my research assistant, Eric Jung, uh, spent quite a bit of time going through official WeChat accounts of Chinese companies uh, abroad, but also the local governments in, in China to see what they had to say about party building, and it is surprisingly much. Uh, these accounts tend to be very open and frank because they are intended not for the general publication or general public, but they're intended uh, and aimed at uh, specific people within a company or in a locality, and then specifically party members and party cadres. So that was a fairly rich source of information um, that I will tap into more, I think, uh, in, in the future. Um, it's also quite surprisingly that on these accounts, but also in some of the publications, actually, that we saw that the, that the authors are much more forthright than you would expect them to be, saying things that are actually extremely sensitive, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, in the course of this paper. But I'd like to start this presentation by um, briefly discussing um, how party building, in my view, fits into the overall range of tools that the Chinese Communist Party has at its disposal to project its influence and power abroad. And this doesn't mean that I am um, aligned with people who think that Chinese influence abroad is always interference and is malign. Absolutely not. In fact, that's one of the main things I always want, point I always want to make. Chinese influencing, yes, there's lots of it and it's growing, but to a very large extent is something that you should expect from any rising superpower. And there's nothing particularly special about it. Um, and in fact, when you look at American influence and interference abroad, it's probably a hundred times worse uh, than Chinese influencing. And that is something what, again, you expect from superpowers. So anyway, what are the instruments then? Um, the key concept that you see time and again is the concept of soft power associated with Michael Nye, of course, uh, who made this famous. Um, and it's the opposite of hard power, hard power being the ability to coerce uh, other actors. Soft power is to seduce them, as it were. Um, to make them voluntarily see your point of view, 
and go along with what you think is right and should be done. Now, the key thing about soft power in Nye's original formulation, of course, is that it's separate from state power. It's the way that Chinese, American culture and Chinese society have an influence that is autonomous from uh, what the state and the government want and wants and, uh, and does. Um, but in China, when the Chinese authorities discovered this uh, in the early 2000s, when Nye gave a couple of talks in China, um, they made it an instrument of statecraft and also of public diplomacy. So with that, the party now is developing the soft power narratives and it dominates and directs these, the actors that it wants to influence. Um, so in uh, the Chinese reconceptualization of soft power, it is a way for China to develop and transmit its long-term coordinated and comprehensive public diplomacy policies and messages. Uh, almost the exact opposite, of course, then, of the original formulation of Nye. Now, more recently, in the context of a more alarmist debate about Chinese influencing and interference, we hear quite a bit about the concept of sharp power. Um, and sharp power is usually not very well defined. It is also a heavily politically charged concept. It is accusatory, as it were. Um, but sharp power uh, is state-driven. And it seeks to exploit the openness and free flow of information that democratic countries have, um, not just for any purpose, but to abuse and even undermine that country's values and policies. So uh, this is really uh, sharp power is really the concept where the sharp ends, as it were, of the Chinese influencing debate comes to full fruition. Um, my point is uh, in this paper that uh, this. Uh, um, conceptual apparatus of hard power, soft power, and sharp power misses out on a hugely important aspect of Chinese influence. And I'm sure there are actually more, but this is um, at least one of them that is missing. And that is what the Chinese Communist Party itself calls its organizational capacity, and uh, Zhu Li, uh, but what I will call organizing power because of that fits very nicely in the, in the, in the, uh, with the other types of power. So um, this organizing power of the Chinese Communist Party is not, uh, in my view, <clears throat> a, a strategy or a devious plan to make the world more socialist, Chinese, and preferably both. Um, I think it's actually something that is being developed by the Communist Party as it goes along. Um, it is, um, com the Chinese Communist Party feels itself compelled almost by the increasingly increasing presence of Chinese party members abroad and Chinese companies, of course, and Chinese institutions abroad to, um, to act upon that and to pull them into the system again um, in order not to lose influence over them uh, during their sojourns uh, abroad. So it's not a devious plan, but a um, response to the challenges and opportunities of Chinese globalization. Um, Chinese globalization is something that makes the world quite literally more Chinese, just like in the 20th century uh, US hegemony made the world more American. And for the CCP, um, this Chinese globalization increasingly provides incentives not for convergence to liberal norms and institutions as um, uh, Western observers uh, until about 10 years ago still uh, often thought, but instead this Chinese globalization um, pulls China away from these liberal norms and institutions and, uh, and, and pushes it in the direction of strengthening its own neo-socialist order, not only domestically, but also increasingly abroad. And organizing power, as I said, is a very important part of that. So this party building abroad is, is very different from the things that are usually pointed at uh, when people talk about Chinese Communist Party's uh, influence and interference abroad, but that focuses on the work um, of the United Front Department and also sometimes of the International Department of the Communist Party. Um, these are specialized agencies that uh, specifically have as their task to, to, to spread the Chinese Communist Party's influence over 
targeted and selected actors uh, abroad. Whereas party building yeah, or organization, organizational power uh, is more of an open-ended process and influence if that that generates is, is a, almost a byproduct, I would say. So the logic behind organizing power is a combination um, of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's own Leninist principles, organizational principles, and its view of its leading role in Chinese politics and society. And uh, these two things come together in its organizing power abroad. So in this, the concept of party building is central. And party building is something that I've never really given much thought to. Um, I thought, uh, until I started writing this paper and doing some digging, uh, I thought it simply as baking, making the, power, the party bigger and better, uh, and not more, more else than that. Um, but actually, it is uh, not only um, a, a specific uh, domain of, uh, of, of policy, but it's also uh, an important aspect of the organizational apparatus of the Chinese Communist Party itself. Uh, in 1988, a, a central party building work leading group of the Politburo was established, and importantly, both Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping were the leader of that group just before they became the, the general party secretary. So that shows how important party building really is. It is um, a, a way for um, uh, new leaders to really establish their grip over the party apparatus and with that they grip over uh, the party uh, as governance of society. Um, so this concept of party building at Dangtian refers to what we could call self-improvement activities that are undertaken by the party itself to maintain its own unique nature. So party building uh, in includes and involves the full range of party activities uh, propaganda, education, and training, something I've worked on uh, a lot in the past, uh, um, normal organizational work, uh, cadre uh, work, of course, discipline inspections, but also the work of mass organizations and the, even the United Front. So party building involves teaching, research, and theory building as well. And it's even a discipline uh, at party schools throughout the country. So it's not just something you do, but also something you reflect on and think about um, and uh, theorize about. So party work most importantly is uh, intended to lift the party spirit, yeah, Dang Xing, and to strengthen party discipline, Dang Qi. Because aligning with this, the party's members and cadres with the methods, work style, vision, goals, and ideology over the center. Uh, it's really important to understand that party building therefore operates in the area in between the, chat, the party's own external role and functions, which are usually called the work of the party, Dang de Gun Zuo, and on the one hand, and more routine internal party affairs, which is called Dang Hu Gun Zuo. So party building sits in between, between the party's external work and the party's work on itself. And that gives it its, its importance and its power. So party building is how the party must manage the party itself and it brings to that together ideology, organization and political practice. It, it's party building um, is a way for the party to be, to be an instrument of governance, not just of governance, but an instrument of political transformation in pursuit of its own ultimate goals and mission. So it's inherently political. Um, it's not just a technique of, uh, or a set of principles of organizational procedures, but it, it is, gets right at the heart of the party's own Leninist mission to be a vanguard of the proletariat. So as we uh, undoubtedly all know, in the past 15 years, party building work has been stepped up massively uh, and Xi Jinping, of course, has uh, done his utmost to, uh, to do that even more. Um, and with that, increasing the presence of the party across the Chinese society, but also its effectiveness and, again, its, its political nature. Um, 
And the same, uh, I argue in this paper, applies overseas. Uh, China's increasing globalization presents the party's ambition to strengthen its grip with a number of particular challenges. Um, and these include uh, not only the presence and, act and activities of party members in, in foreign organizations and companies, um, it also necess necessitates the management of party members um, uh, residing outside of China. So the number of Chinese students, as we all know, has increased massively and there are <coughs> party members among them. State-owned com companies and other institutions have increasingly, increasingly have projects and investments um, uh, abroad. Uh, and again, there are party members uh, amongst the people that manage these projects and investments. And lastly, uh, labor recruitment offered agencies in China often send very large numbers of Chinese workers and employees abroad for temporary contracts, and again, there are party members <clears throat> amongst them. So party building work abroad um, is only aimed at people that are uh, temporarily abroad, the people that intend to return to China. It is not aimed at overseas Chinese people who've emigrated permanently. So the latter, as we all know, are still subject of the parties uh, overseas Chinese policies that are run by the United Front Department and not by the party's own uh, discipline inspection and organizational departments that are in charge of party building. Um, there is at the moment a, uh, mostly a, a mention of party building, broad, building abroad amongst uh, government funded students. Um, temporary uh, laborers, and particularly amongst uh, employees and leaders of state-owned uh, enterprises uh, abroad. So uh, I've found very little mention of party building work uh, amongst people that have gone abroad um, on their own without support uh, of the state or government, uh, like self-funded students or private business people or employees of private companies. But no doubt that is going to change as we now see in China that the private sector is increasingly reined in and being subject to party discipline as well. I would expect that, that also to happen abroad. And in fact, we already found at least one mention of Huawei already in 2017, wholeheartedly and enthusiastically saying at a meeting that they fully support part party building work within the company, both domestically and abroad. So there you go. Um, anyway, so uh, party building abroad is, is really about um, the requirements of Chinese system and the felt need to expand the, the reach of that system and the tea drip um, uh, abroad, because so many aspects of that system are now abroad and need to be somehow knitted back together into China, lest they they, they, they depart from um, the orthodoxy of the party line and do things on their own, heaven forbid. So party members abroad will in principle remain members of the party committee uh, to which they belonged in China. Um, and these party committees back in China, so of their university or their company, <coughs> are in principle required to involve them while abroad uh, as far as possible in the activities of that party committee. But of course, that is very difficult quite often given the distance um, and also the time differences in particular involved. Um, so um, in addition to uh, retaining their membership of their party committee or party branch back in China, party members abroad must also be locally uh, involved in the party's work. And in theory, the party committee or the local Chinese embassy or consulate is then responsible for these party members amongst students or amongst employees of foreign, of, of Chinese state of enterprise. Um, for foreign workers, it's a little different. Um, there are the recruitment agencies that post the board are principal or responsible for their local party work. Um, now, this is a long-standing policy. It dates from 1984. And uh, the literature that I've read is uh, unanimous in its assessment saying that it, it doesn't work. 
Um, the long distance from China makes that it's very hard, if not impossible, for party back in, committees back in China to involve their members while, while abroad. Well, party committees in embassies and consulates consulates are less than enthusiastic with this task that they have to fulfill, uh, possibly because they don't get enough credit uh, for this on their own uh, current evaluations. Uh, but that is something that remains a little unclear. Why it is that party committees in embassies are so lackluster in their performance here? Um, and this presents the party with a couple of problems. Um, the most important problem is that um, they fear that uh, party members while abroad will um, uh, can will give in to the temptation of the sugar-coated bullets of a Western lifestyle and what they call international style forces. Now, the term sugar-coated bullets is, of course, a wonderful term that dates from the early 50s of the uh, the Sanfan and Ufan uh, um, campaigns, um, and has been uh, reinvigorated uh, for this particular purpose. Again, it is the bourgeoisie, but now the foreign bourgeoisie and bourgeois forces that uh, endanger uh, the purity uh, of party members. So with the possible erosion of party spirit and party discipline amongst these members abroad, uh, the party is in danger of losing its control over its own members. And that is, of course, the most dangerous thing that can happen. This, uh, the literature points out, is also a problem for these party members themselves because they are supposed to return to China. And then they may find that their time abroad actually has tainted them, um, has made them bourgeois. Um, and uh, that may very well go, again, at the expense of their own career within the party, but also perhaps even their career in the company that they work for. Um, so in order to do more uh, about party building work abroad, um, there, were, there have been various uh, regulations, one in 2004, um, that uh, call on enterprises to establish party organizations and carry out party work uh, abroad uh, according to the requirements of flexibility, simplicity, safety, and interesting, confidentiality. And this comes back later. But in 2016, a specific leading opinion was issued by the party center uh, on party building abroad. And of course, this uh, leading opinion is not publicly available. We've tried our uh, level best to get access to it. We haven't been able to. If anybody has a copy, I would be uh, very, very pleased to get it. But um, one or two of the articles that we looked at actually um, outlines the document. And uh, so we've been able to piece together what's in it um, in good philological uh, in, uh, fashion to reconstruct uh, the main gist of the document. So in accordance with these regulations, party building work abroad should be based on five principles. Now, I will not go through all of them. They are in the paper, um, but I will only discuss the second, which is the most striking one, um, because this um, says that um, uh, party building work should, of course, be carried out. But in many countries, Chinese Communist Party activities are not allowed by the local government. Um, read Western countries. So covert party activities are therefore often necessary. And methods based on the internet and social media, I'll talk about that, about that in detail later, must be used more than in China. And such activities take place on what is called the principle, on the base of the principle of the five non-disclosures, the Upu Kung Hai Yuanze. Uh, the, and the five non-disclosures are the non-disclosure of party organization, the non-disclosure of internal party positions, the non-disclosure of party member status, the non-disclosure of internal party documents, and the non-disclosure of internal party activities in overseas party building abroad. So the five non-disclosures help overseas party building to avoid local, political, economic, and cultural and religious risks and, quote, provide protection against the long-term and stable development of overseas party building, uh, against threats against the long-term and stable development of overseas party building, I should have said. 
So here the party basically simply admits that what they do is, um, is illegal abroad uh, because it goes against uh, what uh, the local legal system or local government allows and they do it nevertheless, but then just uh, surreptitiously. So in practice, the five non-disclosures mean that party activities and discussion of party work must never be held in the presence of foreign employees or visitors, nor should party activities take place in public places outside the company premises and work sites. This is clearly targeted at state-owned enterprises, obviously. So foreign social media like Facebook and Twitter and other uh, such media should, of course, be avoided. Uh, instead, the company's internet and WeChat official account should be used, but we've just found out that we can get access to that anyway. Um, for the consumption of foreign employees and visitors, party activities should be presented as part of the company's corporate culture and team building. And I have to, we'll have more to say about that later on in, in the presentation. Um, not only amongst companies, Chinese companies abroad, but also amongst Chinese students, party activities are carried out under other guises in order to avoid arousing suspicion and even censure. A recent article on foreign party building among students observes that, and I quote, due to the special political environment overseas, some party members have kept, quote unquote, invisible for a long time. They rely on international student organizations to integrate the training of party members into other activities, such as Chinese culture promotion and exchanges, international volunteer work, speech contests, debate contests, etc. Um, this is pretty, I would say, uh, dangerous stuff actually, because the party here simply admits that they're doing things that um, have been suspected of for a very long time. Um, and uh, I would imagine that people who believe in uh, the nefarious intention of the Communist Party wherever they go, will um, immediately uh, take hold of this and say, see, we said it all along, um, we can't trust them and we should kick them out um, if, they haven't, if they are here still at all, which is not what I want to say, uh, I would like to emphasize. <clears throat> uh, in fact, what I think that should be, do should be done is that we should allow party work abroad to become publicly uh, acceptable, but within clear constraints imposed by us abroad. So we say what we allow in terms of party work and what we don't allow, um, so that we have more transparency and also a little bit more grip uh, over it if they do things that are not what we allow. Uh, but that's my take. Uh, that's not the take, I would say, if, uh, of people uh, like, say, Alex Jos Joske and, and others at uh, ASPI and, and think tanks like that. Um, so we return to party work. So party work abroad uh, mainly has to do with striking the right balance between central discipline and local circumstances. This is really important um, because Chinese companies, this is mainly about Chinese companies and projects uh, the party of course knows have their own strategic objectives. Um, and these, um, the party believes quite rightly um, will in time, if left unchecked, make these companies and their foreign operations in particular increasingly global and less Chinese and less communist party-like. Um, so party building and party work in these companies and projects is intended to ensure that these companies and projects do not stray too far from the plans of the CCP and its vision for the Chinese nation. So it's specifically and explicitly uh, targeted against this idea that many people have, including myself, is that if and when we allow Chinese companies to become more and more global, they will in time become part of the global capitalist system and lose their Chinese and Communist Party uh, character. And the Chinese Communist Party knows this, is aware of this, and is taking measures to ensure that that won't happen. However, the party also uh, in its regulations of 2016 emphasizes operational work, profitability and flexible adaptation to local conditions, uh, which is not that different from what they do with uh, the way they manage state-owned enterprises in China itself, by the way. So um, they say two things. First of all, 
party work helps combating corruption and coordinating the activities um, with other companies and institutions abroad, but also it is a way for these party building works should not get in the way of profitability uh, and the further development of the foreign footprint of, 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 of Chinese companies. So party building work really wants to strike a balance between on the one hand control by the party center and the other hand allowing enough flexibility and room for these companies to continue to expand and be and continue to be profitable. So um, these are the principles. So what does it mean in practice, really, this party building work abroad? Um, so the, the key thing is that uh, party members abroad are much fewer and farther between than there are in China itself. So local party branches, which also have to be established, we have seen already, um, have to be drawn, therefore, quite often from party members that work in very different departments of a company or even altogether different companies or projects. So it's part of a sort of a, a loose collection of party members that happen to be in one particular place rather than people all working for the same work unit. Moreover, these party members abroad tend to be not very much fixed in a particular place. They travel a lot, particularly higher cadres, of course, they travel from place A to place B all the time. So it's very hard even for these local party, temporary party branches to um, hide them into their work. Um, so uh, this means that um, the, uh, the party, local party branches cannot be asked to take on the full load of normal party work for these party members. And the most important uh, party work, uh, particularly party evaluation and the collection of the party fee, um, will still have to happen by party committees back in China to which these party members belong. So there's a clear division that there should be, uh, I should say, a division of labor between local party branches that are have work more on, in terms of, of study, of monitoring, um, and of uh, linking up, um, and party committees back in China that are more in, uh, in charge of discipline, in charge of evaluation, and in, in, in charge of long-term um, development of party members. Um, having said that, um, abroad, because of the scattered nature of these party members quite often and the distance from their party committee back home, uh, party building work relies much more even than in China on online party work. So um, some party committees distribute e-readers with some of the party's constitution and party building classics. I'm sure everybody has been waiting to get that e-reader and catch up on some necessary reading. Um, as we saw, um, WeChat official accounts um, are very, very important actually to disseminate um, uh, state of the art as it were, documentation and information about party building, both in the company itself and in other companies. What the party also relies on, just like in China, is uh, party building apps. There's a special foreign party building app called Hai Wai Tan Tian, and that 6.1 plus one actually, um, which is specifically targeted at party members abroad. And this is not only intended to disseminate information, but also to monitor party members' activities, because every time you open the app back in China, they know that you've done so, and they can keep track of what you do and where you are. Um, and that's a very, very important tool, obviously, for the party in general to keep track of its party members in China as well, but abroad they do the same thing. So they want to make sure that you do your daily um, study um, of the relevant new party documents and, and policy guidelines. And of course, they also want to know that you're actually where you say you are. Um, in addition, uh, party building work uh, is also intended to go beyond party members uh, abroad themselves. It is, in, it is intended, there's three further goals, you could say. Um, first is keeping Chinese and foreign employees happy and in line. 
and then enhancing the competitiveness and management of foreign operations and projects. Presenting third, third point, presenting a positive image of the company and China to the outside world. Now, this is really important because party building work then goes beyond just managing party members. It becomes a tool for the party to spread the word and uh, it becomes a soft power tool way beyond the party's organization itself. It is um, party building work and you see that time and again becomes a, a shorthand really uh, that uh, points to all that is good and reassuring about China, its system and increasingly very important, its culture. This is a point that comes back time and again, party building work and Chinese culture, modern Chinese culture and also some traditional Chinese culture are conflated in increasingly. So spreading the word about uh, China's story becomes about party building work, but also about culture and about the Chinese nation. And at some point, and the system, at some point, it becomes impossible, quite deliberately so, to disentangle them again. The party building work is also involved in labor relations and management, um, which of course is um, something you also see in China itself. Uh, but party building work uses the language principles of disciplining um, and, uh, and, and management to um, uh, ensure proper labor relations, but also to ensure that uh, party that, that labor remains disciplined and obedient, which of course is, um, let's say, quite ironic that Leninist party building principles are used to discipline labor. I thought that the revolution was in fact intended to liberate labor, but here it is actually to unliberate labor, it seems. Um, so as I said, the Chinese party building work, partially through this concept of culture, becomes a magic wand to strengthen China's presence and impact abroad. Party work ensures that Chinese actors do not alienate foreign partners, governments or publics. It becomes a public policy or public diplomacy and public relations. Uh, um, exercise. Um, and it helps thereby create a positive impression of China, Chinese enterprises, uh, and uh, the Chinese, Chinese system, all at the same time. Right, so um, this means that party building work, and I'll run, go now straight to the conclusion because I'm running desperately out of time. <clears throat> Um, wants to do uh, several things. Um, so it's, um, it, it wants to, at the first hand, it wants to strengthen the party's grip over its members, but it also wants to um, strengthen what we could call the China brand um, or the Chinese, Chinese culture, the, the image of China much more broadly, and it wants to also help specific companies in their operations uh, while abroad. And these three objectives, of course, they overlap, <clears throat> but they're not the same. So quite often uh, in party building work, you see that the party is trying to do these three things at the same time, but is, uh, is aware that they may conflict, and they, but they don't try to resolve these conflicts but rather they try to sort of go along as things develop. So again, this gets back to my, my point that party building is not a beautifully crafted plan that is then systematically rolled out from Beijing, but it's something that uh, the party is learning by doing. It is something that they in practice have to do um, because of the way that its own system and its own economy and its own society is globalizing rather than that it's a, it's a plan to make the world completely Chinese and completely communist, completely socialist. That's not what they want. Um, they want to ensure that the party's integrity uh, remains the same, that the Chinese nation's soft power um, and public diplomacy and public relations agenda is served and that Chinese companies can as much as possible and Chinese students as much, much as possible Get, um, do their work abroad uh, in the best possible way for the greatest profit for themselves and for China. 
All right, um, I think I should leave it at that and open it up now uh, for any questions. All right, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, for questions, uh, please use your blue hand, which you find under participants, or if you don't want to come come on screen, you can also use the chat box. But uh, but through the video is preferred. Uh, let me let me kick off with one question. Uh, uh, well, one observation and one one question. Uh, first, you seem to be relatively at ease with these activities. It's sort of that the party does, and and, and I mean, I, I used to be a member of a party. They actually had overseas branches. There was a Washington branch of the Dutch Liberal Party when <laughs> when I was when I was there, and I don't know whether that was an official branch or not, but I was there. Uh, but but some countries seem to not be at ease because some countries ban it. I was actually interesting to hear which countries ban such activity. Okay. But the question is uh, the, the the well then it's the second question. The second question is, it seemed that this party building overlaps with some of the other departments. So with the uh, the, the, the the United Front, with mm -hmm. the propaganda department, and now also increasingly with the increased merger of party and state, increasingly also with, say, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, mm -hmm. and the foreign representations. How, how does that work out? So those are my two questions. Okay, well, that's, that's basically you're cutting right at the heart of the whole thing. Um, first of all, countries that forbid party building work or party work abroad are uh, most Western countries, and particularly the United States, Australia, but also my own country doesn't allow it. Um, so it is countries that see the Chinese Communist Party as potentially subversive, essentially, um, and believe that communism uh, is a, uh, a force that um, they want to keep out of their own societies. So they try to separate out the Chinese Communist Party from the rest of China. That's, that's how they, they seem to perceive it, and which I think is a fallacy, and that's also the main point. I think we should accept that the Chinese Communist Party is an intrinsic part of China, whether it's abroad or in China itself, and deal with it accordingly uh, and see it as a normal part of Chinese society uh, rather than as something we, uh, we want, to, um, want to fight against or uh, guard ourselves against. Um, so that, that's basically my point. But what you're saying is, of course, entirely true, and that is exactly why dealing with the party head on rather than trying to sort of completely keep it outside is even more important is that it starts merging um, or can start merging with other uh, types of work, particularly United Front and, and the international department. However, at the moment, I haven't really seen evidence of that. Uh, and that, but the the real question is, to what extent will that continue to be the case? Uh, because there's nothing uh, that stops the Communist Party in principle to say, okay, well, we can use party building work also amongst overseas Chinese. Why not, right? Um, and and then I think, or we can even use the party organization uh, to join up with foreign elites uh, through the international part. And of course, then we get into territory that at least as a, a Western, I would say, that's something we don't want, and we want to ban that completely. Um, but at the moment, they still are restrained in their work. And as I said, that part of building work is something they, they're still developing, and they don't quite know also where it's going. And for them, it's really sort of something they're learning, and it's also something that is necessary for them, rather than something they, that they consider to be a plan. Um, but, uh, of course, you see already the first inklings of it joining up with uh, other agendas, particularly through this idea of cu culture, this idea of uh, public uh, diplomacy and uh, public uh, relations, the China brand, uh, 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 telling Chinese story, China story, and so on and so forth. Now, this is something you see more in Belt and Road countries, particularly in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, Central Asia. Uh, you see it much less in, uh, in Western Europe or America or Australia, obviously. Um, but this is something that may come our way in the West as well. Right? That you start with party building just being uh, a way of managing party 
members while they're abroad and eventually becoming, as were the, the thicker end of the, of the wedge, uh, and is becoming a tool of, of public diplomacy and soft power. And then the question is, to what extent should we allow that and shouldn't we allow that? But the main point is that we should be open and transparent about it and demand and enforce also openness and transparency from the part of the Chinese Communist Party. So I'm arguing against the five non-disclosures at, at the end of the day. And I think the five non-disclosures should be the five disclosures. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I would second that. Um, I think Sans, uh, but you can speak for yourself, Sansa Hofstede had a question. You find the overlap between overseas party building and overseas Chinese affairs, but I think that is now answered. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's, uh, Sansa can always come back in, but let's go to Lance Gore, who has a blue hand up, and then uh, Chen Gang. Hey, Frank. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I like your talk very much. You know, this is a very new area and uh, uh, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of uh, the CCP getting its act together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, it, it is a sort of exploratory uh, area for the CCP as well. So I, I have one question and one, one comment. Uh, one question mm -hmm. is that uh, when you study these uh, party buildings, uh, you know, obviously, sure. you know, uh, the cadres who hold power uh, and the ordinary party members, mm -hmm. their incentives are quite different. And uh, uh, how do you, mm -hmm. uh, how do you distinguish, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the CCP want to promote some program, uh, you know, uh, what kind of a role, you know, the ordinary party member can uh, play. And uh, uh, even mm -hmm. even it's a cadre, then I still there's a very much a fragmentation there. You know, if uh, those cadres are scattered uh, among different uh, companies, uh, so who is going to coordinate uh, uh, them? Uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, what uh, you know uh, the parties uh, uh, you know uh, long term uh, prom plan. Of integrating, you know, this mm -hmm. catered uh, outside uh, uh, China. So that's a question. Uh, the, the, the 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 commentary is that uh, I think, uh, the, you know, pretty you know, what you describe pretty much uh, is a description of what's happening inside China. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the party is uh, uh, a Leninist party. Uh, I would say that uh, mm -hmm. they are trying to extend uh, an older, older party mo model, you know, which is uh, organized for planned economy, organized mm -hmm. for war fighting. They try mm -hmm. to apply the same model mm -hmm. on a free market. Mm -hmm. So they run into a lot of problems, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, party membership now, you know, is secondary for most Mm -hmm. ordinary party members, or even some cadre party members, that's a secondary status for them. You know, their mm -hmm. identity, primary mm -hmm. identity is aligned with the profession. You know, mm -hmm. that's where uh, they, they get their job, they, uh, they create their, their career. Therefore, party, the rule of party, I think uh, the CCP is uh, struggling with this. You know, what do you, yes. how do you offer the incentive for them to participate in a party activities? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in a community party building, for example, uh, for a long time, they have a big problem identifying party members within, living within the community because they don't have incentive to show up because mm -hmm. you don't want to, mm -hmm. after a whole day's uh, hard work to go to party, you know, mm -hmm. study meetings, mm -hmm. Concession, yeah. sessions, etc. So they rely on pre, pretty much rely on a lot of these uh, retired uh, party members who has nothing to do, you know, <laughs> older people. So, so uh, uh, and also you know uh, in companies uh, that's the same thing, you know. 
in companies uh, until recently, the SOE, bigger SOEs, uh, the CCP passed regulations uh, specifying their role in decision making, mm -hmm. in allocation personnel, you know, uh, allocation of fund, uh, mm -hmm. decision making, etc. Uh, but okay. for for most for most other places, uh, you know, they are still from Jiang Zemin's time. Uh, he emphasized a very vague term. That's a political call for the mm -hmm. company. So yeah. what does that mean? L Lance, let me, let's let's not take a whole <laughs> half hour for for a presentation. Okay, let's give Frank a, a, a chance to react. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Lance. Um, Obviously, very, very important points. Uh, I agree with just about anything, everything you say. Um, first of all, I should make a slightly meth more methodological point. That is, I rely on Chinese publications that have an inbuilt uh, bias to report on good news rather than bad news. Uh, because m many of these things are written by cadres themselves, party building cadres themselves. So, of course, they want to report of successes and not report on problems. Um, having said that, um, what I find striking here is probably two things. First of all, is that the party makes um, a lot of the fact that it is necessary to strengthen party discipline and party spirit because there are problems. So they, they say, yes, there is insufficient party building, party members are straying from the herd, we can't control them and we really have to do our level best to rein them back in. Um, secondly, is that they use party building and the party's apparatus with that, um, not just to for organizational purposes, but also for specifically political purposes. So they really want to ensure that state-owned enterprises and other enterprises eventually as well, um, will do what the party center wants them to do. And they should, of course, develop their own interests, as I said in the presentation, in our interests and our agendas. But um, when needed, they should always uh, submit themselves to the requirements of the center. Uh, so this is the discipline aspect. And that is emphasized time and again. And the third thing, of course, that they're doing is, as I said in the presentation also, is party building work is more generally a tool uh, to present a positive image of the party and of China and Chinese culture and Chinese system abroad. Um, so they, they, have a, they have a very broad agenda and they are aware of the problems and the fact that they've got to do something about it. Um, so I, I don't agree probably with you that there is a fundamental contradiction between the requirements of the market and the requirements of party building. Um, and if there's a contradiction, then the party center is very much aware of it and tries to find some kind of middle ground, just like they're doing in China, right? They, at the moment, they are reigning in the, the private sector uh, through regulation and through, through discipline um, measures. They don't do that to kill off the market, but they want to make sure that the market is serving, ultimately is serving the goals of the party center and not that the party center is serving the goals of the market. And the same thing applies abroad, but then magnified because the party is much less present, of course, abroad than it is in China. Does that answer your question? Or oh, you have another point about party members versus cadres, right? Mm -hmm. um, the articles that I read actually surprisingly don't make a distinction. They just talk about party members. Um, but of course, the difference between a cadre and an ordinary member is huge and very, very important. And actually, but the, the important thing is that also cadres are seen as a target of the, the center's dis discipline and party building. So they're also seen as part of the problem or something that has to be, has to be acted upon uh, rather than as only their instruments to help rein in ordinary party members. So in that sense, they're, they're treated just as party members and um, the fact that they are leading a company perhaps or have an important job within the company is secondary, they all are targets of this party building effort. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, 
this is uh, still uh, you know uh, unfolding flow fluid but uh, uh, when you say you know they want to propagate in China's uh, you know uh, soft power image mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know uh, doing you know kind of a maybe public demo, uh, diplomacy etc but they run into a problem the legitimacy mm -hmm. of a party in a foreign setting. You know, if you look sure. at Hong Kong, even Hong Kong Communist Party is an underground party until very recently. You know, the party member, they, they, they are not to. to. So there's mm -hmm. a compatibility problems, a very serious problem there. Sure. How do they overcome that? Yeah, well, perhaps a way of conceptualizing this also is to think about an organizing power of the party as <clears throat> a pool uh, in which, or a, a, a concept in which uh, hard power, soft power, and sharp power come together. So it's not just one of the powers, but it's the thing that ties it all together for the Communist Party. Uh, but anyway, you know, this, this, this is a really interesting... Okay, thank uh, you the, very much. The, what, what, is what, is what, what is interesting is the... Uh, w with the much more prominent role of the party, in a way it starts conflicting with the former roles of the state. I mean, that's what I saw... Yeah. In in, sure, in, the world, sure. in the World Bank, where the party became much more ambitious in terms of thinking about development and thinking about economic problems within and, and outside China. And they wanted to hear from the World Bank. And then tongue in cheek, we first said, well, you know, you've always been insisting of us not being political. How can we talk with a political party? But but the Ministry of Finance was very, uh, our, our formal, formal interlocutors, they were very relaxed about this. They said, yes, of course, it's the party. When, <laughs> do, do go and talk with them. But uh, of course, we always did. But uh, I, I thought it was really interesting because there was this new role where the party invited us to speak about Hubei mm -hmm. development. And so something something very new. And it's, I see some of this tension here as well. But let's go to Chen Gang. Uh, thank you. Uh, Frank, I think your topic is very timely and uh, important as the uh, upcoming sixth plenum of the Communist Party of China will probably uh, be focusing on this party discipline again. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, almost every sixth uh, uh, plenum uh, will, will be designed to, uh, to, to focus on this party building, mm -hmm. party discipline issue. Uh, so my question is, uh, we know that uh, five years ago, at the last uh, sixth plenum, uh, the mm -hmm. Communist Party raised this uh, uh, policy of comprehensively uh, governing the party in a very strict way. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. the last five years, do you think uh, they have achieved what they want to achieve uh, 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 by all means, by all these kind of party building and discipline uh, activities? And for the upcoming uh, sixth plenum, do you think uh, Xi Jinping will use that uh, to launch another round of discipline? I will try to avoid the, this word purge. Yeah, discipline uh, campaign before the 20th uh, uh, party uh, congress. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so okay. this is my question. Thank you. Thank, thanks for your questions. Um, and about particularly pointing out the importance of the sixth plenum, of course. Um, I can't judge, and I think none of us can judge at the moment, how successful the party has been. Uh, we simply don't have the metrics to do so. Uh, I doubt very much if the party itself has all the metrics. Uh, but one thing we should, I think, be clear about is that party building is much more than just discipline. Right? Discipline is one aspect of it. But the key thrust of party building is exactly that it ties together all these different aspects of the party's work. Um, and it's led, I would think, not so much by the Discipline Inspection Committee, although they are heavily involved, but more by the Drew by the organization department. Uh, and in fact, the Drew and the, the GWA both uh, have seats, uh, the, the vice chair seats in the small leading group for. Uh, party building. And so they are the two most important uh, institutions that lead party building work. But when you look at what they do, um, it's clear to me that the Juju Pool, the organization department, is the more important because uh, discipline only comes much later when things really go wrong. And you know, the things that I read are much about sort of more the positive thrust about party building work and you know, what it can achieve, what it can do 
rather than simply reigning and disciplining and punishing uh, Kant, which is an aspect of it, but it's it it, it is something that comes comes last, as it were. That's the last thing you do if things really go wrong. Uh, but your question is a really good one. Uh, what will Xi Jinping say about party building? Um, will he continue sort of presenting this as a positive force, as uh, a great aspect of uh, why China is so important and such so developed and why things are going so swimmingly in China? Or is he saying, no, we've got massive problems and we should stamp up discipline because all these party carders uh, and members are straying from the herd and we, we really have to rein them back in? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a question, just we have to see how it develops. If I take the cues from the July 1 speech on the 100th anniversary of the party, he was pretty congratulatory and, and mm -hmm. positive on the party building. Yeah, of course. But you can't say during the 100th anniversary that, no, we've been around so, for 100 years and things are really, <laughs> really, things are really going to shit. You can't say that, right? So. <laughs> who, who, by the way, I mean, you said something important. So who is currently the head of the leading group on... Now, that is a really good question because I dug into this and I don't get an answer. Uh, the one person that is might be the leading group is, is uh, Wang Huning, right. actually the propaganda right. Sorry. Yeah. Um which isn't really that uh, sort of uh, that obvious that he should do that. Hmm. Um, but it, it used to be, um, as I said, uh, Xi Jinping did it before he became... General Party Secretary, who didn't held it before we became General Party Secretary. Uh, before that, it was, um, what's his face now? Um, <coughs> who was the guy who was purchased in the early 90s? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so that the propaganda, uh, sorry, our leader of the Communist Party, the Politburo, is in charge, says something, I think, about the positive uh, side of party building rather than the disciplinary side. I think um, if anybody in the in the room knows, that would be interesting. If I think Liu Yunshan was also the head for a while. Hmm. Okay, but it's it's unclear, right? It's very clear what happened until two thousand and ten, um, and then you don't get any information about actually who headed up that that leading group. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I will look it up in my party building app then. Uh, Change your ways. Yes, please do. Yes, please do. Or you can perhaps just uh, post the question, right? Because these, they're <laughs> yeah. all chat functions. Right. Um, so I'm sure they'll uh, answer immediately. Change your ways, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, so the, so the, for the uh, statement crisis, a lot of critics uh, in domestic wise, uh, people are talking about the, uh, the corporation, uh, corporate governance structure of SOE uh, is not so modern. Because the party committee, uh, party committee, the supervisory board and board of directors, they are overlapping uh, mm -hmm. in many major uh, state -owned enterprises. Uh, so that's a way to, uh, you know, uh, so board of uh, directors and the supervisory board could be uh, institutions actually to uh, realize or implement parties, uh, with, uh, you know, decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another. So, sure. so in the context of the uh, overseas uh, branch of those uh, state-owned enterprises, I'm not sure what in what form, in which institutions, a uh, party um, party's decision can be involved in day-to-day -day operations of the uh, of the company. Uh, well, so that's in, very simple. Uh, yeah. It's because the, the leader of a uh, foreign branch of a state-owned enterprise is, is the party secretary as well. So they have, what they do is, uh, unlike uh, the situation back in China, is that the party secretary and the director are the same person. So you don't have the, uh, the normal setup that if a party secretary and the director is the vice party secretary and the party secretary is the vice director, right? It's all conflated into one person. So they're the party and um, the enterprise are the same thing. All right. Okay. So so the uh, so it will be not related to the board of directors and also those supervisors. Okay. Thank you. Well, th no, that is a point for investigation, right? I mean, to what extent does a board of directors still function, or whether it's simply the party committee, the board of directors, are the same thing? That's something that I'd like to find out. 
Thanks. Yu Hong, please. Yeah, thank you, Director. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Professor uh, Picker. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it's enlightening. Uh, actually, I have questions on the Communist Party's uh, the global outreach, right? Mm -hmm. As you may aware, right? So early this month, right? Um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party actually is held a so-called uh, CCP and World Political Leaders Summit, right, in Beijing virtually. Uh, it's claimed that uh, more than 500 political parties and organization um, from more than 160 countries actually attend this meeting, right, this summit. Uh, Xi Jinping mm -hmm. uh, actually gave a very long speech, actually. My question actually is what was the motivation uh, for help to organize this kind of summit, right? So do you see this uh, summit actually is a part of uh, CCP's, uh, what would say that uh, the global extension strategy, mm -hmm. or you see this actually is a part of uh, the CCP's effort, try to rally the country or the partner support amid so-called great power rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, what, 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 what was your take on this summit? So what was well, the motivation actually to yeah. this kind of thing? If, Thank you. If, 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 it, if it is what I think, what I think it is, uh, this is something that is organized by the International Park Department. Correct. Um, and um, that's very separate from party building work because it's targeted at, at foreigners, right? Mm -hmm. Not even overseas Chinese, but it's targeted at foreign elites and foreign political parties. And it's explicitly a way of extending the party's uh, relations with people that and organizations that matter in the politics of other countries. Uh, I was myself was involved in three or four of these meetings uh, until I became director of Merricks and was no longer that welcome um, in 2018. But I've been to one in 2003. 14, in 16 and 17, I believe. And the interesting thing was that this is something that was new. Uh, the international departments um, first reached out to uh, foreign sinologists, including myself, and by visiting us in, in Europe, in Denmark, 2013. Um, that was very interesting. Um, and it was also bizarre because Leo Lushan was there and he gave a speech. Um, um, we had a discussion with this, I, he gave a speech. And um, then we were invited for the first event in Beijing the year after. And that was very, um, not amateurish, but very informal. They're saying, yeah, we're trying things out. We, we don't quite know what to do with this. Uh, it's an idea. And we want to see how we can link up with, uh, you know, important people abroad. And, you know, use China specialists are obviously very important, which, of course, was a mistake they later on corrected. Um, because they found out that China specialists have absolutely no influence whatsoever abroad. So that was all very uh, jolly, I must say. Um, and then in 2016 and 17, became much more formal, much more uh, choreographed or uh, organized. And the final one in 2017, Xi Jinping himself indeed gave a speech. What was also very interesting that in previous occasions, there were discussion sessions held of selected delegates, foreign delegates, with a member of the Politburo, uh, which I also attended. Uh, one was done by Wang, Wang Shishan and the other one by um, uh, Li Yuanchao, um, which were very, very interesting also to see who was allowed to ask questions, who wasn't allowed to ask questions. The Americans were not allowed to ask questions, Europeans were, and friends of China were asked, allowed to ask questions and people that were more critical were not allowed to ask questions. Um, so this is a template that they have developed over the, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and now it's become massive and the real main participants are uh, usually chairpersons or of political parties, former prime ministers or ministers of foreign affairs of, um, of countries, both Western and African, Latin American, uh, Pacific countries as well. Uh, and the target is really shifted from a DAC, academics and China experts to these you know, former or present movers and shakers abroad in the hope that the party itself will have influence over them and ties them to its own work and mission. But it, again, it's very separate from party building, which targets Chinese party members that happen to be temporarily abroad. Dr. Shanwei. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Frank. Uh, may I have two questions? The first is about uh, the concept. Uh, uh, I wonder in what sense uh, that this concept of organizing power can be put into the framework of uh, hard power, soft power, and uh, sharp power. My understanding of that uh, three types of power is about international politics. It's about how one country use this, this kind of power to influence the behavior of other country. Uh, but this organize, organizing power, according to your paper, is about how to uh, hold the party itself together, how to ensure the party's control over its, uh, its uh, members overseas. So, so, my under, um, so my question is, is, is there any, yeah, how to explain this? Uh, this framework. Okay, may, may I answer that question first? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, now I agree with that. Um, but uh, towards the end of my talk, um, I also try to make clear that this organizing power is being used for a much broader purpose than just um, organizing and disciplining party members abroad. But it's also used for uh, soft power, uh, public diplomacy, public relations, uh, China branding and so on and so forth. So in that sense, organizing power, as it expands its scope, becomes a part of these other powers, particularly soft power, of course. Yeah, but okay. you are right that in principle, it is quite different from uh, these other parties because it, the party targets itself rather than external actors. But in, the, in practice, you see that that distinction gets lost uh, abroad. And it becomes a tool then also to, to influence um, and to spread the word, spread the message. Is yes. that your second question? Uh, yeah, thank you. The second question is, uh, is about, uh, I wonder if you notice any uh, variations of this uh, party building activities across different types of uh, Chinese organizations. For instance, uh, is the party building more active in those state companies than among those uh, visiting students or like in Confucius Institutes. You didn't mention Confucius uh, Institutes, but uh, I guess there should be some party building activities going on. So yeah, yeah, very well, the, the last thing about Confucius, I didn't uh, find any mentions about party building in Confucius, but yes, I would imagine that each Confucius Institute has several party members that then are part uh, or must be part of uh, the part the, the, the local party branch that is nominally coordinated by um, the, the Chinese, Chinese embassy, local Chinese embassy. Having said that, the Chinese embassy is less than um, very enthusiastic about this type of work, quite honestly. Um, so variations, yes, what, what you very clearly see is that the main thrust of the whole party building work is, is about state-owned enterprises, and particularly large state-owned enterprises. Uh, that is really what it's about, because these are strategic, um, these serve broader goals and have an impact that is far, far greater than Chinese students. So that is the main thrust. Um, Chinese students are also mentioned, um, but then only students on a, a state scholarship, uh, not students that are there, um, are self-paying self students or remain outside uh, the the remit of party building work. So it's really it really is about people that are the responsibilities of the Chinese state. That's really that that is really what it's about. Uh, and people that are uh, outside of China because they fund their own studies or because they invested some of their money or they they run a, comp a private company abroad. They they are outside of party building work at the moment. But as I said, also, this is already beginning to shift. Uh, and it, it, the logic points very much in the direction of also trying to include more and more party members that are not specifically there on behalf of, of the state itself. All right, a final question for which we have time is from Sarah Tong. Um, thank you, Frank, uh, very interesting. I think it's uh, in particular um, for, for people like me, look at the uh, party's role uh, in, in SOEs and in domestic sectors uh, primarily. 
So I think the uh, discussion on how, how companies going overseas and then party building, it's, it's something to me, at least it's quite new. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's, I thought that's a very uh, important and interesting perspective. Uh, my, <laughs> my question, uh, my question is, um, whether it's this 100 year anniversary or otherwise, the party rhetoric is that the party is, is, is instrumental uh, for China's economic performance. Mm -hmm. my, my, my confusion or, or my difficulty is that if you look at the post 49, uh, when the economy is doing well, it's, it's when the party's role in the economy are declining in relative terms, uh, whether it's the overall economy or is it the companies themselves. Uh, so, so there is something that you have to reconcile. Mm -hmm. You say the party is important, but when the party is very, very strong, it's not doing too well. I noticed yeah. there's uh, uh, the issue of Dang uh, Zheng Fen Jia, and now there's mm -hmm. more about Dang Zheng Fen Gong. It's cool. like we're not separated, but we're just doing different things. But then in the, uh, I think Ji Wei mentioned earlier about the corporate governance, you're actually having the party on top of the governance. Um, yeah. So, so in that sense, uh, how do you reconcile that, you know, when the party is really dominating, that's not very good for the economy or for the companies uh, themselves. So that's, that's the first question. How do the party attempts, at least attempts to resolve that? Okay, Second, can I answer the question that's, first? That's a really big question already. And uh, okay. let, let's give Frank uh, a chance. Okay. Well, in, in a sense, this question was also asked, I think, by Lance uh, in a slightly different way. Um, and yes, of course, uh, I would agree that in principle, uh, party building and particularly the party's own strategic agenda um, uh, goes against the grain of, uh, of a market economy, obviously. Otherwise, the party wouldn't have to do it. If the, the economy would do what the party wants, it doesn't have to give it steering and guidance. So yes, I would, uh, I would agree with that, that the party gives itself itself the possibility, the instrument, instruments to go against what the economy naturally wants, right? Um, that is a price that Xi Jinping very clearly is willing to pay. That is the whole thrust of what he's been doing over the last, what is it now, nine years, right? Willing to pay a price in terms of economic growth and economic strength um, in, uh, to, to achieve more party discipline and a stronger party all around and more strategic guidance. Um, so in that sense, party building abroad is not different from the habits in China itself. However, interesting thing in the literature is of course that this problem is completely elided, right? It's, it's glossed over because they say um, party building is good um, because it strengthens uh, these companies. It makes them more um, uh, competitive in the world market. It strengthens China's brand and the confidence that the world has in Chinese companies and Chinese economy. Um, it makes, uh, it, it enables these companies to manage their laborers better, to manage their internal op operations better. In short, there is absolutely, there is, there is absolutely no contradiction whatsoever between what the market wants and what the party wants. Um, and uh, so the problem is simply axiomatically um, defined away. Can I ask the second part of my question? Quickly. Okay. Um, it's actually related. Um, I'm thinking that Dang Jian uh, party building domestically, it can sort of uh, manage to, to talk them through because domestic market is very much strongly influenced by the state. Mm -hmm. When you go uh, overseas, it's not quite like that. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. so, so to talk yourself through to say that party building is going to help me uh, in terms of a company, private or otherwise, uh, that, that's a harder sell. Uh, I'm of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> but so, that, so that's my second part of the question. Okay. Is, no, you're I, having uh, issue uh, domestically, but you can try to manage. But overseas, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, more st a difficult story to tell. I, I completely agree, obviously. 
Um, but there is, there is at least something to it. And that is that party building can be, if done right, be an instrument to discipline the company as a whole, right? Um, so to bring everybody in line with what the management wants um, and to ensure that um, uh, the employees are more disciplined uh, and better behaved and don't strike, for instance. Um, so that, and in terms of public relations, it may also help. So I think there is something to it, but the, the, the whole uh, irony is, of course, as I write in the paper, is that it uses Leninism for capitalism, right? So capitalist development and labor exploitation are being, uh, being strengthened uh, by using communism, which uh, boggles my mind, but apparently it doesn't boggle the mind of the Communist Party itself. They seem to be completely at ease with it. All right. Well, uh, I don't think we've seen the final word of that. Inside China, increasingly, of course, aligning yourself with the party prevents surprises such as Jack Ma and others have gotten. Indeed, uh, yes. Um, internationally, um, actually, within China, it's interesting because it's it's straight against the foreign companies' law, uh, the the law on foreign companies. So that that literally has clauses that the party will not interfere. And so the party cells are a real, are a legal problem, if you want. Internationally, of course, the problem. Well, is, we know that that doesn't stop them because abroad they have the, the five non-disclosures, right? Right. So... <laughs> it's the it, same thing, right? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, but uh, it, it's, it's interesting by itself because uh, talking about the, the tensions of... of countries increasingly perceiving Chinese companies as being an instrument of the state only gets confirmed by this type of operation. Yeah, that except that it's not an instrument of the state, it's an instrument of the party. And that yeah. is really important, I think. Uh, uh, I, I, okay, I, I may, maybe I make less and less of the distinction, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but that's, <laughs> that's something for a different seminar. We're exactly at five o'clock. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that really most of the people that came stayed. We started with 52, we have 48 left, and it means that it was a very engaging and interesting debate on, a, on an important and emerging topic. And I'm sure uh, over time, uh, Frank will not only write a paper, but will write a book about it. Professor Pika, thank you so much for joining us and for presenting, and uh, I look forward to further discussion on this point and otherwise. Thank you, Bert. And everybody else, thank you very much for coming and uh, have a great weekend. All right. Bye-bye.